Um, so I'm going to talk about the role of computing a little bit in society in general, and then I'm going to talk briefly about one of the problems we're looking at. My group is relatively large. I have seven math students, and I have three engineering students, and we tend to look at a lot of different problems because we have a lot of different interests. So I'm going to focus in on, on one piece as we go along here. Um, so what is computing? Computing is an essential part of society around us. It's an important part of the STEM disciplines. Uh, computational science has developed into its own, a discipline in its own right. It really represents sort of a, the third leg of science as things stand. And computational tools are really a key in the 21st century for helping us do scientific discovery in many areas, uh, from biology, where we're looking at genomics, through uh, physical sciences, where we're trying to understand the origins of the universe, to modeling and simulating uh, how we build and design computer chips. Computing all pl plays a critical role in every part of these, uh, in uh, every part of these scientific endeavors. Um, I like a tongue-in-cheek description of computing because, frankly, I think it's good to bring a little levity to the situation. I like to say computing is when pen and paper are no longer the right way to go. So really, it's, it's when the problem becomes so big that to really tackle the problem, you have to bring to bear tools of, sci uh, of scientific computing to the problem, use the computer to help you analyze the problem. And so what does it mean to bring computing to analyze a problem? Well, you have to have knowledge of the application you care about because if you don't understand the application you're trying to study, you're probably not trying to develop the right tools, understand the right behavior for the problem you're looking at. So you have to have application knowledge. You need knowledge of computer science, that is, how are you going to trans, how are you going to program and, and represent things in the computer? And you need mathematical skills, you need approximation theory to say, how do I take this problem and best approximate in what the computer can do? The computer can really do four things well. It adds, it subtracts, it divides, it multiplies. Everything else we make it do is based on really those sorts of skills that it can do. And so really translating models into something that can be represented in that way is where mathematics comes in. So the goals of what I do, I, my group focuses on sort of three areas. One is uh, membrane science. So membranes uh, are used in many aspects of science and technology and fuel cells, batteries, and in solar cells, they're what's called a separator membrane. The, these are functionalized polymers that let electrons go one way and ions have to go a different way, and so you get current drawn through this, driven through the system. And so this is really how you develop models that accurately describe the morphology and accurately describe their behavior is one of the things I'm interested in. The same sorts of models also play a role in biological applications, so I'm interested in how these models play a role in things like lipid bilayers. Um, another area, the area that I got my start in that we work in is plasma science and what I'm really interested in is how plasmas can be used to affect the world around us, improve the world around us. Everything from spacecraft propulsion systems through building better fuel systems for jet engines, plasmas actually can play an important role in these sorts of systems. And so I, I work in plasma science is one of the main areas we focus on. And then it turns out that related to computing, um, because as we move to large-scale computing, we end up with such massive amounts of data. Right now, I'm working with the uh, uh, Oak Ridge Research Lab, and they're working on kinetic simulations where one time step of the simulation generates about four petabytes of data. That's an amazing amount of data. And how do you even sift through that data to find the essential information? So data science is crossing over and playing a really important role, not only through society in general, but in scientific computing, we try to do large-scale computing. Data science is playing a really important role there as well. And so these are things that I care about and I work on. And so, so what does my group do? My research group works on developing new computational methods that help give a better understanding of the world around us for problems that we're, we're barely starting to understand right now. So I'm going to talk about one of these problems right now. It's a correlated plasma. So first of all, to understand the problem, you have to know what a plasma is. <laughs> to understand the problem, you need to know uh, what does it mean to be correlated, and then who cares? Why do we care about this, right? So that's really, that's the three things I want to say in the next couple of slides. Um, and this is joint work with uh, Ying Da Chen and John Rabancourt, and then Go Tim and Mir are two of the students in engineering that are helping with this work. So let's start with a simple topic of what is a plasma. Uh, you start with a solid and you add energy and it melts into a liquid, okay? And if you heat it up more, you add more heat, it breaks, it evaporates into a gas. And if you add even more energy, what happens is the gas molecules themselves, the, the, the fundamental molecule breaks down and separates. So you end up with ions and electrons, the charged particles floating around as a gas. That's a plasma. 
All right? It's, physicists like to refer to it as the fourth state of matter. It's 99% of the visible universe. When you look at the night sky, at, when you look at the sky at night, it's 99% of what you see is in the plasma state. Um, to give you a, a sort of a reference for understanding, it's hard to understand when you add more energy, what does that really mean? So if you talk about a, a, a laboratory plasma, we're gonna go in the lab and we're gonna make an argon plasma. Uh, an argon plasma is where you add, take an electromagnetic wave and you add a lot of energy and force the gas to break down. The temperature of uh, laboratory plasma is typically for the electrons around three electron volts. One electron volt is 10,000 Kelvin. So it's really, really, really hot. There's a lot of energy in the system. You could ask, why doesn't it just melt the system and evaporate? Because 30,000 Kelvin should melt any metal, right? That would be what you would think. Turns out that typically when we talk about laboratory plasmas, they're so dilute that the amount of energy that they impact the side of the system is so little that none of this stuff melts. And so this is, this is but laboratory plasmas are an important part of science. They're actually, this sort of stuff is where I got my start is actually studying how we manufacture computer chips. So laboratory plasmas play a really critical role in understanding how we manufacture computer chips. So uh, what is a correlated plasma? So I've described what a plasma is. So let's start out with what, uh, what we're, what, how we're going to make the plasma. We're going to do something a little bit crazy. We're going to take a gas and we're going to cool it down to 0.1 Kelvin. And in doing so, the matter is going to change state and it's going to form what's called a Bose-Einstein condensate. So what you will have is you'll have a collection of, of bosons that collapse down. So the matter is going to change from being, uh, instead of like a frozen solid, it's going to collapse down. You'll get this core of bosons with a cloud of fermions around the outside. So that it's actually going to change from the way we think of matters as being ions and electrons to being this different state of matter. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take a laser and we're going to try and separate the electrons from, the, from that cloud by just adding enough energy to force it to ionize. And in doing so, what we form is what, uh, uh, we form a plasma where the ions are 0.1 Kelvin. Then zero Kelvin is absolute zero in the universe, right? So we're talking very cold plasma. And then we're going to add one, and the electrons in it are one Kelvin of energy. So that, that are, so they're very cold as well, but they're enough that they actually act a little bit thermal. And so what's interesting about this system is that there's more potential energy than kinetic energy. So what is potential energy? You think about a ball, a ball at the top of a hill. When it sits at the top of the hill, that's its potential energy. When it rolls down and it's rolling, that's its kinetic energy. So this system has a lot of potential energy, not kinetic energy. And what that means is the system actually tends to behave very <coughs> correlated, that ions tend to act as a bulk. They tend to behave as a rigid body motion. Even though they're a separated gas, they have very different dynamics when we think about gas molecules in the air. And so the, the question, an important part of this problem is that electromagnetic waves do not couple in ways that we understand well to these correlated plasmas. And so why would you care about why, why would I care about trying to couple an electroma electromagnetic wave to this correlated plasma? Well, okay, let's talk about a completely different problem, which is the motivation for the problem I'm looking at, okay? The completely different problem is if you consider a solar flare from the sun, all right? So the sun has uh, these big solar flares, and what happens is energetic particles from these solar flares get trapped in the Earth's ionosphere and bounce back and forth between the poles. And this is due to the Lorentz force. They get trapped in the magnetic field lines of the Earth, and they go back and forth. These energetic particles, with a big solar eruption, if it actually was to happen where one was to hit the Earth, those energetic particles would destroy modern communication satellites within a matter of hours. And so who cares about this? The telecom industry, those of us who like our cell phone, like I like to talk on my cell phone. I like to do all sorts of stuff on the internet. I care about whether this actually happens. So what you want to do is you want to think about, is there a way that you could prevent these energetic particles from destroying the satellites? Well, okay, there is a possible solution, which is to try and use energetic electromagnetic waves to knock those particles that are trapped on the Earth's magnetic, uh, on the Earth's magnetic fields into what's called the loss cone. If you can knock them into the loss cone, they'll drift down and they won't impact our satellites. They'll actually burn up coming into the Earth's atmosphere. So you, if you could couple the magnetic waves into the ionosphere, uh, and you could knock these energetic particles out of, the, out of the magnetic field. The problem is that the Earth's magnetic field is full of dust. And why does that matter? Because dust charges up negatively. And the dust charges up negatively, negatively and it's very heavy. And it starts to look like that ultra-cold plasma I was talking about. Very big, very, very heavy, very slow-moving particles with lots of charge. 
and the energetic ions look like now that we've reversed the roles, they look like the electrons. In fact, it is a correlated plasma. It behaves very dynamically like a correlated plasma. So who cares about this? Well, all sorts of people in telecommunications as well as the Air Force really care about this. How do I couple electromagnetic waves into this correlated plasma to knock these energetic particles into the loss cones so they're not going to destroy my satellites? So why are we looking at, all, why are we looking at say, uh, a Bose-Einstein condensate turned into a plasma instead of the dust particle? Well, it's really, really hard to model a dusty plasma well. And so we're trying to understand the fundamental process of how you, mo how you co connect electromagnetic waves to a correlated plasma. So we're looking at a laboratory setting where we can actually do very accurate modeling. In the case of a Bose-Einstein condensate, there are so few ions that we can actually model each particle within the system individually. It's a very, very small system from what we're used to talking about. So since we can model every particle individually, and there are very, very good laboratory benchmarks, we're trying to build a virtual laboratory so we can understand the impact of correlation in these systems to try and develop more coarse-grained models that would allow us to model larger systems that include that correlation in them. And so we're trying to start at the small level and build up to the larger level to try and tackle this bigger problem. And so that's really what this is being motivated by. So my group does a lot of things. Um, in particular, we look at uh, functionalized polymers, we look at inert gas lasers, we look at plasma-assisted combustion, we look at modeling correlated plasmas, we look at data science tools for, representing, uh, for, for minimal representation. We look at next generation HPC kind of tools, high performance computing and multi-scale physics problems. And we look at scale bridging numerical methods. And all of this is really trying to tackle very big problems, but we're trying to take it one piece at a time, working on better tools, better numerical methods, and trying to do it very systematically with the hope of making a big impact in the end. And so with that, I'd like to put up a slide of all the people who do the really hard work, which are my students. <laughs> and so these are my current students. Uh, in mathematics and engineering and my current postdocs. And so with that, I'd like to thank you for your time.